Restaurant design and cafe and bar design is, is extremely influential in the way that it um, informs where we eat and drink and socialise and interact and um, the way that we engage in sensory experience through space. Um, but I feel that often we look at restaurant design in particular from the perspective of the customers. And so for, the, for a story in the issue, we wanted to look at um, design from the perspective of uh, the front of house staff. So the people that are working in the space every day and, and the people that sort of really know um, what, what, f what design features enable smooth and efficient running of a restaurant um, and, and great dining experiences. Um, so we turned that uh, story into a panel discussion um, with some hospitality pros. Um, I've got Kate Christensen um, from Franklin in Hobart sitting next to me, um, Andy Joy from the Carlton Wine Room in Melbourne, and Kylie Javier Ashton from Sydney, Momofuku Siobo in Piemont. Yeah, so um, just as a little disclaimer, um, none of this panel is in the design industry, but these guys have um, worked at some of uh, Australia's best restaurants, so they have a very pragmatic approach to um, restaurant design and then working in those spaces. Um, so to kick things off, we're going to speak to Andy. Just He's recently opened um, his... Oh, I might give a bit more background, actually, to these guys, sorry. Um, Kate, um, Kate Christensen is... I'm starting with her because she's next to me and also she's travelled the furthest from Hobart this morning. Um, Kate... <laughs> she's the tiredest, yes. 6am um, flight. She uh, currently works as a sommelier at Franklin and um, she has also worked in restaurants such as Coda and Tonka um, and Movita in Melbourne and also Banksy in Sydney. Um, she also, with her partner, has opened a travelling pop-up concept um, which uh, travels around the world, everywhere from Perth to Portugal to France and Tokyo and sets up in other restaurants um, for a month or two at a time. So she's got a really great understanding of like, going into other people's spaces and sort of taking on the, in the environment there. Um, Andy is from the Carlton Wine Room in Melbourne. Um, he has spent a number of years working in bars and restaurants um, as a sommelier and as a restaurant manager, most notably for the McConnell Group for a number of years. Um, he's worked for Cumulus Inc, Cumulus Up, Marion and Cutler and & Co um, and has been involved in the design of a couple of those restaurants as well, um, Marion and Cumulus Up. Um, but early this year he opened his own restaurant. Uh, the, well, it's a, bar, it's a wine bar and bistro, uh, five floors, the Carlton Wine Room um, in Melbourne and uh, opened it with a couple of friends. And t he, the interesting part here is that he took over an existing site and so they spent a couple of months renovating that site and sort of like um, re-establishing a new, a new space. Um, his father's also an architect, so he's got a long history in, uh, in the industry or like sort of exposure to the industry, I guess. Um, Kylie at the end here is our um, local Sydney girl. Um, she is the general manager at Momofuku Siobo, which is the first um, Momofuku restaurant um, outside of the US. So um, Kylie has also worked at Tetsuya's, uh, Bentley, Duke Bristro, and, um, and then started at Momofuku uh, in 2011, shortly after they opened. So she's been a really important part of the evolution of that restaurant over the last sort of six or seven years. Um, yeah, so we might crack into some questions. Um, we'll start with Andy. Um, he, so he's recently opened his own, own venue. So I sort of just wanted to get an understanding about coming from working in someone else's venue versus um, designing your own space and, and, and what you learnt from kind of that process. I think one of the main things I learnt is that everything costs a hell of a lot more than you believe. Um, <laughs> so every decision or finger we pointed at something cost us an extra few thousand dollars that we didn't have. Um, and I think that that for me was the most interesting part of the process and sort of something I think you're going to probably see evolving a lot more now in the restaurant space as it is, is that we are going to see a lot more people taking over existing venues and trying to implement their own ideals on those venues and re-augment them to their own needs and requirements. Um, the fact to set up something from scratch now, um, it's such an expensive exercise and unless you're a large restaurant group or someone with a lot of money that they'd like to lose, um, it's not really an option to really set things up from scratch for people you know, in my age and below my age bracket. There are a lot of people out there that want to do these businesses but the fact is that I think that the best model going forward will be that they will be taking over existing businesses and going in and re fitting them essentially or rearranging them for their own requirements. And I suppose that's what we had the most um, 
you know, not trouble, but like we were trying to take a business that had had probably a, a fair few years of not great ideas thrown at it and basically strip it back to um, a bare shell and, and start again. And it, we, we, we were very good in that we, you know, as you can see the photo here, that's the main bar there. Um, we c tried to do as little as possible with the greatest amount of effect. So just changing that bar from a timber bar to a marble bar and then stripping the bar back and then basically painting and, and redoing everything. Um, you know, those bonquettes have been refitted and that sort of stuff. Those, just those little touches that make a dining space a little bit more softer and more approachable is, is what we we're going for. And I think the building itself is such a beautiful old building that we were trying to create a space that's semi-timeless in some regards, but does have reference to that, that older um, aspect that it has as, as a building itself. So for us, it's about creating a space that's like almost like you're at my house. So hospitality for me is that. It's me being able to give you everything of myself in a space that's comfortable to, that, to express that. So I think that design-wise, you know, I think there's been a bit of a shift, or there should be a shift away from that austere sort of style because it doesn't actually produce great hospitality in my mind. It actually produces things that are a little bit sort of staid and tight. So our place, you can relax and you can basically come in and just fall apart as you want because that's what hospitality should be and that's what we sort of tried to go for with what we did. Mm, you've, you've talked about the spaces um, with, with words like usability and accessibility. How, how did those, some of those things play out in terms of the design of the space and the way uh, that you thought about that? Well, usability um, was probably the harder thing for us to build back in because we weren't doing it from scratch. But it's more about um, how we set up like waiter stations and where the accessibility of that equipment is and how quickly a staff member can get something for somebody. That's those are the points that actually make great service. Is you know you, you've all probably had an experience where you order a bottle of wine and half an hour it hasn't turned up because the seller happens to be in another building down the street and the person had to go and get it. That's happened to me once. I'll never go to that venue again. So. I think accessibility for that is, is about pace of service. So thinking about things that are to hand all the time, you know, the ability to set a table within a time frame. So set that time frame in your mind. How long should it take to get that done? And where do I need my things to get that thing done? That's what I'd say. And then in terms of like if you are going to do something from scratch, I mean, like you want to talk about usability and accessibility and actual working in space, the first person you should talk to is not the owner of the venue, it's the person that's going to be the food runner. They're the one that's going to use the space and they'll give you a better understanding in terms of design than the owner will because the owner will have this idea of what they want but the person doing it will be the food runner or the guy in the pot wash, you know, the people that do the base level work, those are the ones you need to speak to I think, you know, and they should be involved from the beginning. Kate, you've worked at some very iconic restaurants around the country. Um, in your mind, what are some of the most, uh, I guess, aesthetic restaurants? What are some of those spaces that you really, um, you re that really speak to, like restaurant design and that, that, and some of those features that are very iconic in those places? Um, I think certainly where I'm working at the moment, Franklin. Um, I really love the space because it has this real. Obviously, the bones are mostly concrete. Um, so it's got this really like sleek and um, drive and lines are really important there. But then what I also love about it and, you know, and because in, with a lot of concrete, you know, it needs softening as well. So I love what they've done with the textual elements and the tactile elements within the space as well. So they use a lot of wood to bring warmth. Um, they have linen curtains that sort of semi-divide smaller spaces for... Um, like a bunkette would, I suppose, in a way, to make an intimacy within such a large open space. Um, and I really love the natural tactile elements like um, visible wood and um, cow hides and, and indoor plants and natural white light, um, a lot of natural light through the day. Mm -hmm. So I really love those elements about Franklin. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one that comes to mind, which is a beautiful space, um, which I spent a few years at, is Tonka in, in Melbourne. Um, again, uh, what they've done with basically a long rectangle is fabulous. They've really divided it into three sort of spaces. And it's sort of a journey from you come down quite a, quite a grotty back alley and you come through this beautiful um, big door and um, 
it's a quite a sort of dark and mysterious front bar. And then as you move through, you've got the the kitchen and all the smells and the aromas, and that's a very featural part of coming through to the restaurant. Then there's the restaurant bar, and that's you know a little bit of the bar and then a little bit of of the restaurant. And then you come forward to those big beautiful windows at the end that look onto Flinders Street. And you get this total, the colour palette, the white floors, everything's quite very light and relaxed and you can just go, because <sighs> you come and that, that journey through the restaurant and how they've divided that three parts uh, works really well. Yeah. I also, on a note with, with Tonka, I love the feature of the Nomi Trotsky um, mm. art installation that hangs all the way through, which is a beautiful, big, wired cloud, it looks like. Yeah. And the difference between day and night is really interesting with that as well. So Yeah, it's yeah. amazing that's such a memorable piece even before the days of... It sort of felt like it was before Instagram. So it was yeah. like before it got you know, photographed by every diner. Yeah, you, you also talk about um, negative space in a restaurant in the in the story and the issue. Um, you want to tell us a bit about how you think that affects, you know, a, an experience in a restaurant. Yeah, and I mean, um, this goes back to last year. I spent a lot of time overseas and in a lot of um, working in and dining in a lot of little spaces, and they don't have as much space <laughs> in Europe. You know, Paris and London things are on top of each other, and they don't really have the luxury of space, and that can be very charming as well. Everyone sitting in little um, trattorias or enotecas on top of each other, like right next to the diner next to you, and that has a certain quality about it as well. And what I realised when coming back, how much space we have here. Mm. Um, and but I also how much like diners aren't willing to put up with not having the space as well. Exactly, <laughs> as well. Yeah. This isn't good for me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so um, I really like that some of the venues, particularly the last two I spoke of, they have... Um, you can feel a sense of intimacy because... You can enjoy your company uh, at the table. You're not on top of the next table. Um, and I think the quality of negative space around something gives it more merit. Around something is not just um, it on its own, but it what allows it to be the platform. So a feature like the kitchen or the bar or your table or your guest that you're with, not just... Um, not just um, this, you know, the direct uh, point of focus but how that's encompassed around what's left around that. Mm. I think that's really important. Yeah. Mm. And Kylie, being, being the first moment for Coup Outpost um, from America, were there any specific design features that were sort of essential to that moment for Coup look that, w that were brought to the COBO space in Sydney? Um, yeah, so we were based on a small restaurant in, um, in Manhattan called Co. It was a 12-seat counter-only uh, restaurant. So as you can see in the picture, the kitchen is front and centre of the dining experience. So um, they really wanted to create the same thing in Sydney. Um, however, the restaurant is a lot bigger. So the original Co. was literally 12 seats. It was no bigger than this area here um, and it was trying to transport that to Sydney as a similar concept. Um, I guess, you know, when we first opened, having table seating and counter seating, that's always been a bit of a challenge for us. Um, people either want one or the other. Um, a challenge that we always find is that people who are sitting around the kitchen counter, they get to see um, all the action and they feel like it's they're part of the show and it's always been a little bit of a challenge where people who are sitting on the table sort of feel like they're missing out a little bit. Mm -hmm. There are nights where nobody wants to sit on the counter, they'll get taken through to the kitchen counter and they're like, oh no, we actually booked a table because they're not really familiar with that concept of counter dining because mm -hmm. um, they think that they're sitting at a bar. Um, there are, but there are a lot of things that kind of didn't really work for Sydney that you can't just transpose one concept in New York and then plonk it in Sydney mm. and for it to um, have the same kind of effect. I think a lot of it is that it is a lot bigger. So um, that negative space does have a, a, a big um, impact on 
the atmosphere of the restaurant, um, as you can see in the photos, it's quite dark. So when I hear you talk about restaurants that have that light and texture, I get very envious because everything's really hard in the restaurant. Um, you can't really see it in the photos uh, that are here, but on the outside of the restaurant, we face onto a food court um, and there are bars. There's like black, silver, steel bars. So you kind of feel like you're in jail. Mm. Um, one thing that we <laughs> we learned is that it's not a great space for lunch because it is so dark. Yeah. Um, there's no natural light when people try to take photos in the restaurant. That's another problem that we've had um you know again it's just trying to balance creating atmosphere um working with a space that we were given in a shitty end of a casino mm. um, and trying to create something really special so you know for us it's more about the atmosphere that we create um the energy so having you know in photos it doesn't really do a lot of that justice but <coughs> especially with the food that our current chef is doing, Paul Carmichael's from Barbados. So all of our food um, is centred around the Caribbean. We have reggae music playing. So there's a real juxtaposition as well where you walk into this, like, dark restaurant. There's a lot of hard surfaces. But in the kitchen, there's, like, lots of energy buzzing. There's a lot more warmth around our service. And I think that we kind of almost have to go that extra mile to create that warmth because mm -hmm. the space doesn't do it for itself. Mm. Yeah. How, how has um, the vibe in the restaurant changed over time from and, and how does like the chef and the food that, that that specific chef's creating affect the vibe and the music and those kind of things? Like how do those key little touch points? Yeah, I, it's it's been crazy the amount of change. So when we first opened seven years ago, um, we had... David Chang and Ben Greeno, who has, was our executive chef at the time. Um, Mamafuku and Dave Chang are kind of notorious for being the anti-establishment, anti-restaurant. So, you know, anything that you consider is right for a restaurant, we kind of just throw out all the ideas and the rule books and um, he's kind of a little bit of a rebel in that sense or was, you know, particularly 10 years ago when he started Momofuku um, as a company. I think sort of the dining scene's changed a lot since then. Our food when we first opened was very sort of serious, um, a, lot, a lot more focused on um, Japanese or U more European um, flavours. And then about three years ago, we had a change in chef. As I said, Paul Carmichael came on board and... He's got a very different personality and you can really feel that because it's an open kitchen. Um, I remember there was one particular diner who had been in both times, so she dined a few times and knew both people quite well. Um, she was a friend of the restaurant um, and we hadn't, we haven't really, I mean, we've the, vo the restaurant's evolved. We've made some changes to the actual um to the actual restaurant, but not anything major. And she had dinner at the counter and she was like, oh, have you done a renovation? It feels a lot more open. It feels a lot lighter in here. And I was like, there's really nothing that has mm. changed. The only thing is cha that has changed is the people and the energy and what and we're music. producing. Yeah, and I think that the vision, because it was very serious when we first started yeah. and we were like what we were aiming for and the vision and the goals was that. And people, you know, I remember our reviews were saying like it's like a temple and you can hear the chefs like crying from like being <laughs> bollocked. You know, it was really like there was a very Good. tense. Yeah, <laughs> there was a lot of tension um, in that in that restaurant and that sort of translated to, to the dining experience because it was very – everything was about precision. Mm -hmm. um, Paul is definitely not like that. And if you've ever met him, he's a very like – very likable person, big character. He's always laughing and there's the feeling in the kitchen is very different but that also has made the, f the space feel lighter and more open too. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, I remember dining there um, two years ago and coming into the restaurant and be like, whoa, like really sleek, really dark, this is serious. And then so juxtaposition there's so much juxtaposition with the music and the buoyancy and the generosity of the flavors of the chef 
and the in the atmosphere around it and I was like I really like that I really like that challenge as yeah, a diner cool. really like I thought I'd made up my decision and I tend to do that you know when we work in the industry we have our perceptions and our decisions about like how we feel about somewhere when we walk in and it was challenging for me and it was fabulous I really liked that difference awesome. yeah how do, how do um, I mean, both Kate and Carly work in places that have a very open kitchen. How do chefs feel about that? Do they, does that take a bit of getting used to? Or, I mean, I think all sometimes three of you they can forget. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm yeah, go in. Yeah. Like, I think, because I worked at Cumulus Inc. when that was, like, we, I helped start it up and everything like that, like, 10 years ago. We just had the 10th birthday of it the other night, and yes, it was a good party, thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> but that... Getting used to that was really difficult yeah. to start with. The chefs really hated it. It was really hard. Like that was quite new at the time as well. It was so like, new. Like yeah. it was outrageous, you know. And like, um, you know, you like uh, I think you know you'd be literally sitting there and you'd be watching a chef get like burn themselves. And like that's just was unheard of yeah. up until then. And then I think that really changed quite rapidly after you know Cumulus and also like even Movita to a certain degree. Some in some respects, but probably yeah Cumulus was like yeah you could feel the heat of the the kitchen very very rawly, and from a staffing perspective that was difficult because you had Andrew McConnell in the kitchen and he's a really intense guy to work around. Not that he's yelling or anything like that. He just has a really amazing presence, and I think that that was that was hard from a staffing perspective to try and serve guests with Andrew standing right next to them it was mm. so hard, you know. And But it did put us on our toes. Like, we made sure that that was a cracking experience every single time. So, mm. like, I think that's a good thing about it. It is so yeah. open and... But the other thing I like about it is the fact that, once again, getting back to the idea that you're at my house and there's no separation. Like, yeah. we're all here together. Like, this is a, a joint experience, you know. So I think that that's the way I look at hospitality is, like, if you come to my restaurant... We're all in this together tonight. We're all here, so let's just enjoy it, you know? Mm, yeah. I was going to say, I sometimes work in the kitchen as well and I call the pass, which is right in the kitchen, and I definitely find it difficult yeah. um, because particularly at our restaurant where we serve a tasting menu, so everyone's there for two to two and a half hours, ten courses, and it is quite intense because you're getting that instant feedback and there's no escape. Mm -hmm. So for the chefs in particular, like, you know, if there's somebody that really wants your attention, they're there and they're looking at you and you, there's nowhere to go, yeah. you know. If there's somebody that's sitting in front of you that has really strong perfume, that's also like, mm -hmm. you know, that's you're trying to taste food. That's like, you know, all these there's all these additional elements that you kind of have to play with and I think that it's a very different mindset as well when you're, you know, plating up food and you're doing that and then having to switch to being hospitable and trying to serve someone. So, you know, we've had a lot of people who just won't take a job as a chef in our restaurant because they just don't have that ability to be able to serve guests. I mean, most chefs are chefs for a reason. They would like to be sort of in the back and doing their things. But for us, it's very much of a role reversal where the front of house is more back of house and we kind of just facilitate the experience where a lot of our chefs do deliver the food. Um, so there's that extra element. And I think that it's great for them as well, but it is it can be very intense. Mm. I think one of the greatest outcomes, though, of the open kitchen thing is it actually stopped a lot of the brutality of kitchens. Because you can't go and bollock somebody with a customer who's, you know, in a 70, really 75. Hey? Did that really happen? What? Brutalities in the kitchen. Yes. <laughs> I'm not Now they just happen anything. out the side of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> You're not my friend. <laughs> yeah, I think it really affects the dining experience. I know I was at Franklin um, earlier this year and, um, you know, I, th I think having all that theatre in front of you, I mean, I felt like I hardly talked to the person I was with. I was just like watching, you know, that that chef in front of me and, and that was great. I was like, it was like at the theatre, you know. Um, but I think that is like, I think in a, in a place where you've got two different options for dining, you've got table service and then you've also got up at the bar in front of a chef. Like they have two very different dining experiences. Yeah, and it's interesting to know that from you, from your guys' perspective that um, that the front of house staff sort of go to the back and the chefs take the front seat where it has traditionally been the other way around. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, this is some of these questions are, are open for anyone to to jump in at. But um, what are, what are some of the features, um, like design features of a restaurant that really um, make it easy for you guys to to work in a space, and, and some things that you've experienced that are also very challenging in a, in a in restaurant space. 
Sure. <laughs> um, certainly, um, this just the general layout um, and the how the like what Andy was saying about like uh, waiter stations and service point areas. Just the general design layout at a base level, how that's designed can. Um, hugely influence how you flow and move through a space. Um, I think in our industry time, like you touched on Andy, and energy that's spent um, and in trying to harness uh, your energy as well because they're big hours and, you know, it's quite physical, mental, emotional. Um, if you've got a space that flows better, that just makes sense in your mind that you can perhaps achieve two or three things in one fluid movement, um, instead of backtracking and stepping and it's all about mise en place so everything in its place or, or you know the common rule that everything there is ready all the tools are set out for you to do your job so for me I feel like a really well designed space is designed by people that work in the restaurant which is really important but um, also it's about working smarter and not harder because that energy is crucial for us um, and the time is very crucial as well for the diner and their experience so just general base layout is the most important thing because you know I've worked in some of those little spaces in Europe that were built 100 200 years ago and it's like a three times as small but I feel like I'm taking twice as long to do things do you know what I mean just because of the general yeah and I'm going to say about that is like the outcome of that which designers might not think of but I certainly do when you know I'm trying to create a business that's going to be there for a while is if you have a difficult space and it's hard to work in What's the outcome? People resign. Mm. People walk out the door and that's not a great outcome. So that design aspect is a great consideration and something that I think is, you know deserves a huge amount of thought because if you're just turning staff because the space is actually difficult, you're never going to get anywhere and you're going to end up with a huge debt in two years' time when you have to close the doors. So that's just, that's just reality, you know. Storage is a big one for me. I think it's, you know, we, in our homes we consider it a lot. Um, in restaurants or in venues we don't necessarily, um, but we're always running out of smart storage solutions. Um, for us, a big thing that is on the cards is sustainability and recycling and there's nowhere, you know, we have five bins at the moment to have, you know, all different bits and pieces in and they're just like they're always in the way and you're always tripping over them and you know things that aren't necessarily taken into consideration and a lot of yeah negative spaces we've got a big bar beautiful black marble top bar but it's sort of too far to be able to service guests on and just little things like that so using those little smart storage spaces if you think of a restaurant there's always during the night, a lot of dirty napkins, dirty glassware. Um, we're really lucky in our bar that we do have storage for dirty glassware, but that's also something that I know a lot of venues don't have. And, you know, it's really, it, it's an eyesore when you walk into a venue and there's just lines of dirty glassware everywhere. There's no, like, it's not organised in any kind of space. So, like, that for me is number one, being able to A, have things that are really easily accessible, but B, having places to put things, not just clean things, but also dirty things. And then that way it's like rotated a lot easier and you're a lot more efficient in your movement too. Yeah. Just going to tie the storage thing up as well. The other thing that storage does for you, if it's efficient and good, like it enables your ability to buy more yeah. product. So it enables you to be more profitable. Because if you can buy a large amount of things, you get a discount on that thing and then you could turn more of that thing and then you actually make more money. So therefore, storage, yes, it's a great option. If you don't have storage, you can't actually do that. So it's a huge consideration in restaurant design. And in terms of the, like, in terms of, like, uh, what you're talking about, bins and all that sort of stuff, if you're going to design a bar, get the barman to come in and talk to you. Mm. Don't just design a bar and go, yep, that'll be right, because it won't be. Get a barman in there. They will tell you exactly what works and what doesn't work because they're the one that's going to be in there for 40 hours a week. So... And, and Andy, what do you think are some of the, what the I guess, d design features that you notice um, customers really enjoying in the space? I mean, they could be hooks. simple as... Lots of hooks. Puts hooks, hooks everywhere. It, it, it's weirdly, it is Where one of the first things I go for. Where can I put my jacket? Where's my jacket going to go? Yeah. My handbag. Where am I have it? Under bar. There's a hook under there. What about square perfect. tables versus round tables? Ooh, perfect. Um, well, that's it. like with Carlton Wine Room, we had to put in a big communal table in the, in the downstairs area. And the... Um, table guy came back with the design 
and it was a big rectangular thing, you know, and I'm like, well, what does that say when I walk into a big rectangular table? It gives me this automatic hard edge, and I'm like, oh, a big rectangular table there. I've got to go and skirt my way around it. So I said, curve the edges, make it rounded. And the curving of the edges has just completely softened the entire space. So, yeah, I, like I like the rounded thing as well. Unfortunately, we've inherited some tables upstairs in the dining room, which are absolutely terrible. So we've got to get rid of them at some point. And, yeah, they will be replaced with rounded edged tables. Yeah, Can't definitely. just shave the edges down a bit. And yeah, yeah, sure. I'll get a chainsaw in there and just <laughs> shave the edges down. Yeah. On the square and round debate, um, when we first opened, they did have these beautiful square tables, but they had the legs on the outside and it means that you can't – there's less flexibility with – covers and putting tables together because you could fit four people around that table you could not fit any more than that so with a round of the same size we can fit five or rectangular tables you can put together if the legs aren't on the outside like it was just and our chairs are really bad we've had probably three or four break with guests in them which is pretty embarrassing mm. so much they cost each a lot <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah chairs that People can sit on is also a good and that's good thing that they well. enjoy. Yeah, that's stack. That's and a good, that's good stack. point. <laughs> yeah, um, Kate, how when someone works into a restaurant, how do you sort of make them feel comfortable straight away? Or, uh, yeah, what are you? Um, what are your techniques? Um, I think for me, because I am, <laughs> um, I am often the first person that they see in because I'm often a host as well as a som. Um, I think that moment that they work, walk in the door is the most crucial because you don't get that again. And I think the two simplest things um, that you can – the tools that you can use to connect with someone is a smile and eye contact. That's, that's it. Even if you have 20 things in your head you need to do and you're not going to quite get to them, just that acknowledgement with a smile, a friendliness and looking them in the eye, telling them you'll be with them shortly, that can really set the tone on your hospitality of them in your space. So I think that's something that I um, really try to instil in the staff that we have and also personally. But then, in the, then I suppose when we get them to the table and maybe more so than some of the other staff, I do a lot of talking at the table because I'm often um, advising them on wine, trying to get what it is that they are after, you know, letting them know about how that's going to go with the, f with the food. Um, so I find pause and, again, space around um, your conversation and choosing your words very distinctly, um, directly, um, and using their time and your time wisely while you're there, but also that connection of being very calm and considered even if it's crazy, you know, and you have a hundred things that you need to do, like not showing that to them that you are in control and then that puts them at ease. And, yeah, I mean, it's different from venue to venue depending on the vibe. Sometimes some dark, crazy, loud places and, you know, it's all energetic, but the places that I've been working in recent, especially Franklin, for example, now is that real calm um, and um, personal experience um, really engage with them but allow them the space that, you know, they're not there 100% for you, you know, allow them that space around, get in, <laughs> be calm and then, yeah. So I think um, coming back to those things, are uh, the engagement of eye contact and just a friendliness because that's what we're here to do. We're, we're here, like you said, to be hospitable and a lot of workers can forget that and think, oh, it's my, your, you know, the customer is a problem. No, <laughs> they're not. <laughs> they're paying your wage. And, and your here. rent. Yeah. yeah, and you're here to have a beautiful experience. So that's really important. I think on that, on that point, like, um, it's a like – one of the design aspects you can take away from that is maintaining like a good eye can contact level between the front door and the bar. Mm -hmm. There's got to be clear vision. If you can, great, awesome. If you can't, obviously, because the you know shape of the building, unfortunate. But just keep, keeping that entryway very clear helps to set the tone very quickly. If a customer has to negotiate a difficult entry, a curtain or a thing to get past, to get through, it's already like they're already on the wrong foot. So it's hard to wrestle them back from that point. So make sure it's a clear entryway. On that, we also, when they opened the restaurant, we had a big host stand in at the front door and we took that away um, because it was just this big block of... It was, it was uncomfortable. You know, now we have the technology that we can put our run sheets on iPads. So they're easily... 
moved around. You don't have like to have to have a big computer at the front door. Um, so that was one thing that we did change um, a couple of years in because it was just, it was kind of like this barrier between you and the guest and, it, you know, um, so taking that physical barrier away made it a little bit more open and welcoming, I think. I think it's about taking away all the barriers that say this is us and that's, that's them. Right, yeah. Like anything that's, that creates that feeling for me is actually a bad outcome. Like even using an iPad for me is a bad outcome because I'm looking at this thing. So anything that takes away that us and them concept is a fantastic idea. One of the greatest design aspects of Marion is it's got an, an oval shaped bar. And one of the greatest things I ever wanted, like I ever enjoyed doing there was actually taking customers in behind the bar and going through to their table that way. Or if they'd been, I'd put people over in the side to wait for, have a drink, but always, and be like, you know, push the barman out of the way or just pat them on the back to get out of the way. Oh, I've just, I've just got our friends coming through here. And it just sets a great tone. They're like, oh, God, we feel like we're part of the whole thing here. This is great. And even Cumulus Up's got this bar that's like a square and then, you know, it's one, one side seating here and then the dishes get done on that side. I'd have guests in behind the bar having a drink standing in next to the sink because it's just like, yeah, let's like, I'll do anything for you. Yeah. And you need to create a space where you're not setting too many rules. Get the rules out of it. Stop with the rules. Like, we don't want rules. Rules are boring, all right? And it's not what people go to hospitality for is to be told when and when they can't do something. Except to our bathroom, which is through the kitchen, past the pot wash, <laughs> and there's one in the back, and people are like, this, this really? is it. <laughs> and the dishwasher's like, coming through, stop <laughs> stop washing for a sec, I don't want to splash you, and they have to mop it up so people don't slip over. Um, that's always been a bit of a point of contention for us. Was that a planned design feature that people would walk through the kitchen, or uh, was that just... No, no. <laughs> I think the, they, the bathrooms is one of the other big things that are really important for the guest experience. Um, when they did the initial design for the restaurant, because we're part of the lovely food court at the Star, um, they had the idea that it would just be easy for people to go to the, go to the food court. Um, we realised that that was not viable. Um, and there was a one bathroom built in for the staff, so we turned that into a guest bathroom um, to make it easy and quick for them to go to the toilet. Unfortunately, it is through the kitchen. Some people love it, don't get me wrong. Some people are like, oh, wow, you have, you have to go through the kitchen. You know, people, like, don't know where it is. It's sort of through the back station, walk past the pot wash, and then they're like, oh, this is, like, you get to see everything. There's nowhere to hide at all in the restaurant. However, yeah, it, I mean, it is just one bathroom and that's always been a bit of an issue for us. What about when people don't know where the bathroom is? Is that ever, have you guys ever worked in a space where you've found, I think it's, it's personally, it's something that I think about when I get to a restaurant and I'm like, okay, where's the bathroom? We'll just check. But I mean, maybe that's just, maybe that's just me, but I feel like in some spaces it isn't very obvious and maybe that's on purpose, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I think for me, like, um, I try and, and this might, might sound, you know, a little bit, um, I don't know, um, strange to, but I try to be so observant to a customer that I know if they're about to stand up that they're going to go, I want to know where the bathroom is. And before they've asked for it, just around the corner, sir, towards the back. If you can anticipate that as a server, if someone does that to me, I'm like, that's amazing. You know, and then now and then I get it wrong. Oh, I'm just going for a cigarette. Just outside. I've just had an left. argument with my wife. Actually, I've got to go. <laughs> yeah, but you know, and try to uh, trying to encourage um, so much connection and attentiveness to your guests um, that you can anticipate what's happening next. Um, I think that's even you know better than them looking around or a sign, even you know. Um, no. Um, <laughs> Kylie, did you, you mentioned something before um, about sustainability and it's a question that I wanted to ask all of you guys. What sort of sustainable design features do you think that um, are being started to be implemented into restaurants and that should be and that we should be thinking more about? Mineral water tap. Yes. yes. Stop with the bottled stuff. Get rid of it. Yeah, make sure that's part of the design aspect. I mean, that's going to be a huge thing. We're, we're not recycling in Australia anymore. It's done. All right? It's over. So we can sort of put it in the bin that says recycling, but it's not going on. It's just getting stored. So let's stop creating that waste. You know, that's one of them. Um, the other thing for me, I don't know, it's not really sustainability, but also just serviceability. I think, like, when you think about wine storage, like, we live in a really hot country. Like, start thinking about built-in 
wine storage that's actually that actually works. I mean, that comes from I, the other thing I do is I run a vineyard in the Pyrenees Mountains. So I hate the idea that one of my wines goes out and just sits on a hot shelf somewhere, and then someone tries it a year later and goes, "Christ, that was shit." <laughs> Or but above like, the coffee machine. Or above the coffee machine where it's getting heated up every day. You know, those sort of aspects are the things that you should think about with, you know, wine and stuff as well. The glass washers, we have a – we got a fancy new reverse osmosis glass washer. Um, Winter halter. Amazing. Yeah, they're really great. Not only do you have to polish less glasses – or, you know, but – and which means less breakages, which means less rubbish, um, but they are better for the environment, which has been really good for us. Yeah, And better for time efficiency for staff as well. Like, staff cost. Yeah. yeah, staff cost. You can, like, um, make it up in the cost of that winter halter in, like, a couple of months So of staff costs. So, yeah, we've got one of those in there. They're fabulous. Yeah. Kate, you also mentioned a non-straw policy. Yeah, so mm. Franklin's always had a non-straw policy and that might seem, I don't know, um, you know, quite popular. I mean, lots of places I've been recently don't have a straw policy. But um, we're also in the... Um, what, do, what does that mean, though? What so just not offering a straw. So we don't actually oh, have no, yeah. any straws. Like, um, I know some pubs and some places I've seen around town have, like, we won't give you a straw unless you ask for one. We want you to have a think about what that means when you're done with that straw and what mm -hmm. that does for... Um, um, the environment and just wastage, but we just flatly refuse to have straws. And I, since I've worked there, I've never had someone challenge that, so that's really good. Um, and we're in the process now of um, coasters as well too. We're looking into getting like leather coasters instead of the, the paper ones. But I'm like the coaster Nazi at work at the moment, so I will go around it, it is in the bin to find not in the bin, but in the you know um, to find any coasters that might look okay. You know, but I'm like, guys, we can't just be throwing coasters and business cards just out in the bin all the time. So we're in the process of somehow getting um, more, yeah, like uh, some leather or wood coasters um, and also napkins is a big one as well. Like I know some venues choose to do paper napkins, um, but I think that... Um, if you even with the cost of laundering, I think it's a far better far better option because people just yeah you see how much just like how many disposable napkins get thrown out. So yeah, I think those little things make a big difference. So in to um you know avert one of the wastage points of a restaurant, I mean the amount of paper that you just go through printing menus is outrageous. So well designed menu boards, start thinking about that sort of stuff. How do I you know, how do I get the message across about what we actually sell and what we have without actually having to print it on a piece of paper? I mean, that's a that's another one to think about as well. Yeah. Um, I think we've got a little bit of time for questions. If anyone's got some questions, they want to ask. I have the when mic here. here. Yeah. Yeah. Hi guys. Um, you mentioned uh, briefly about some of the design elements that you really like. There must be some that you really hate as well. What are they? Neon. <laughs> okay. I can stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, um, I think lighting is a really big thing while we're talking about lighting, perhaps. Um, I think um, we've all probably been in a venue where people get their phones out because it's too dark or the lighting has not been considered enough. And obviously, a downlight like we've got here, like straight on as well as a bit intrusive. But using light to reflect off other surfaces, looking at darker spaces that absorb light or reflective surfaces that um, reflect light um, is really important. So when a lighting is not considered, that's something that drives me up the wall because, A, I probably can't see as well and I'm trying to work in it. Um, and also, you know, then it's kind of spoiling the mood when every second person has their phone out, regardless of their age usually, um, because they can't see the menu. So I think lighting is a huge one. Um, and I'm just going to keep going with one more. <laughs> um, and also acoustics as well too. And the same, the same thing, like when you get a speaker, I just noticed it in a restaurant the other day um, in a cafe. The speaker was right there. And I know you've got to put them somewhere. But really think about th how that acoustic sound can reflect as opposed to directly intervene. Um, I think Franklin's got some really great um, absorption um, acoustic systems um, in play, some, uh, some really great um, soundproofing in the roofs and, and the speakers, they face more sort of up and they reflect and then they absorb the, the bass tone and the high, really high tone and then it's sort of that mid um, tones in the music or the sound, again with conversation, that it really absorbs it. You, you feel like you're part of the atmosphere but it's not a dominant feature as well. So I think both those things, using instead of direct, use reflect or absorb. 
Um, I would say flooring is a big thing. We have beautiful, beautiful slate floors, but they're so uneven and then they cause massive problems. So if you're thinking about the chairs, uh, that's one of the reasons why they break because as you pull them out, it's it's catching on the hinge and then the, it weakens all the hinges of our, um, of our chairs and then also tables. So we've got, um, you know, levelers on our tables they're oil though so if somebody slides a table it'll catch on an uneven part of the slate floor and then they break all the time um, so it's really hard to level tables on uneven floors things like we got a Gerrit on trolley a few years back thinking that this would be a great idea and we literally can't roll it in the restaurant because it's so noisy so as beautiful as they are they're really problematic if they're not absolutely smooth.